So, we'll start uh, today's lecture with uh, just wrapping up what we did uh, in the uh, last class, which was the problem of uh, the Rayleigh Taylor instability, right? So, the Rayleigh Taylor instability, we went through the math, the algebra, and found that uh, when you impose the condition that you want a non zero solution, the relationship between the growth rate sigma and the wave number in terms of all the other parameters is given by this relationship, okay. And uh, what we were trying to basically summarize is that if we do not have any surface tension, right, gamma is 0, then sigma squared varies linearly with alpha, okay. That is what we see because this goes off gamma is 0 and this is a constant and then system is unstable for rho 2 minus rho 1 being greater than 0 because here sigma squared is positive always. If it is unstable that means when you have the heavier fluid on top, lighter fluid at the bottom is an unstable system that is what this says. But this is unstable for all wave numbers, okay. This is unstable. for all wave numbers alpha because sigma square is always positive and the more the alpha the more the uh, this thing. So, there is no selection of a particular wave number that uh, is going to happen okay the higher the higher the wave number the more is the growth rate whereas if gamma is not equal to 0, then system is stable for sigma squared, um, sorry is unstable for sigma squared greater than 0. Okay, the system is unstable when the sigma squared is positive because if sigma squared is positive, sigma is going to have a plus the square root of that or minus the square root of that. So, there is one component which is going to be growing, okay. And even if one component grows, that means it is unstable. So, the system is unstable for sigma squared greater than 0, and when does that happen? This happens if rho 2 minus rho 1 g is greater than gamma alpha squared. Okay. So, it means for large or sorry for low alpha or large wavelength system is unstable. If alpha is low, this condition is going to be satisfied, okay. And uh, for the reverse, that is low wavelength system is stable, okay. So, what that means is the surface tension 
actually is going to have a stabilizing influence okay because it is associated with this negative sign here okay that is something which I want you to keep in mind and uh, if you were to now plot for rho 2 minus rho 1 greater than 0 if we plot for rho 2 minus rho 1 greater than 0 maybe I just plot sigma squared versus alpha clearly for alpha equal to 0 sigma squared is 0 and there is some value of alpha depending upon the gamma for which again it is 0. So, there is an interval here in which it is going to be going up and coming down okay for alpha large for alpha large system is stable that means sigma squared is negative okay and for in between for low alpha system is unstable sigma squared is positive okay. So, there is a change of the uh, stability and what this means is there is some kind of a maxima which you are going to see in this dispersion curve okay. What does this maxima correspond to? This tells you the wave number which is going to be the one which is fastest growing the one which is going to actually grow fastest. So, these wave numbers are also unstable, but what you are going to actually see in an actual experiment is going to be um, a pattern which is going to be dominated by this wave number alpha okay. So, this is similar to what you saw in the Rayleigh Bernard convection problem where we found the alpha by the point where the growth rate was um, having a maximum or the Rayleigh number was uh, having a minimum okay. So, I just wanted to point out this analogy here. Yeah, Jason, is that a problem? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering uh, the way alpha is now, if I take a negative value of alpha, then the sigma square becomes negative. Um, if you take a uh, negative value of alpha, yeah, but we are going to look at. Uh, Yeah, so if you are talking about uh, you are saying if alpha is negative, I am just wondering if we have uh, actually uh, made an assumption of alpha being positive anywhere in the derivation alpha x e power i alpha x x is what we have here. Uh, if you take sin alpha No, it was exponential, it was exponential and the alpha that we have is actually square root of uh, alpha x squared plus alpha y squared. So, alpha is positive. So, this is a two dimensional problem. I, alpha is nothing but square root of alpha x squared plus alpha y squared okay and um, this is a, a positive quantity. So, alpha x and alpha y can be negative. Yeah exactly. So, alpha is positive. So, we are looking only at the positive uh, half of the plane. So, the point I am trying to make here is when you include surface tension there is something like a selection of a particular pattern particular wave number okay which is what you are going to see and that is occurring naturally in the system because of the physics okay. So, I think we will just uh, stop the uh, Rayleigh Taylor discussion with this what I want to do is uh, go on to the next problem which is uh, the problem of the capillary uh, jet instability which uh, we have mentioned a couple of times in the class before okay Sir, yeah uh, for large alpha sigma square will be negative right? for large alpha sigma square will be negative correct so, sigma will be complex sigma yes so it takes something like an oscillatory solution yeah so basically um, for large alpha uh, the question is for large alpha sigma square is negative but remember yeah, yes indeed sigma square is negative. So, as far as sigma is concerned you will get a purely imaginary number that means there is no real part the real part is 0 you will get plus or minus i uh, multiplied by some number okay. So, you have a pure, that means the real part is 0. So, you are on the boundary of uh, stability the threshold that is the reason I did not discuss this case where you have uh, the so you really cannot tell if it is stable or unstable okay. If you, you know for sure it is positive, you know for sure it is negative, then you can make this conclusion. So, I am focusing only here 
when I know for sure it is unstable. Okay. Here it is purely imaginary. So, it is marginally stable or neutrally stable. If you give a disturbance, it is neither going to grow nor it is going to decay. Okay. The real part is 0. So, whatever disturbance you are going to give is just going to stay as it is. Okay. So, basically this portion of the curve you really cannot. So, what you need to do is go for higher order terms to understand what happens. So, you can actually conclude about stability or instability only if the real part is either negative or positive. If it is 0, you really cannot tell anything. What you need to do is go for higher order terms. Okay. So, that is the limitation of this uh, linear stability analysis. In the sense, it can only tell you for sure stable, unstable depending on whether it is negative or positive, the real part. System is stable, yeah, yeah. No, for low wavelength here, uh, low wavelength is oh here oh you are objecting to this, you are objecting to this statement here. Oh yeah, so maybe if you should write this is uh, marginally stable. Maybe uh, on the basis of this analysis, this is what I have to say. Marg maybe it's neutrally stable is what I'm going to write. Is neutrally stable. Actually, we cannot really make any conclusions, huh? it is inconclusive. Yes. Yeah, I think that is a good point. Okay. So, what this means is the lesser you write, the less chances of you making a mistake. The more you write, the more chances of you making a mistake, right? I think that is an important lesson more than whether it is stable or unstable. We will talk about this uh, capillary jet instability. Okay? And uh, this particular problem we have analyzed, uh, I mean we have mentioned in the past, but was uh, analyzed long time ago by Rayleigh. I think we need to give him enough respect, so we will call him Lord Rayleigh. Okay? And, uh, and we are going to basically do this analysis, again it is going to be a very simplistic analysis with a lot of assumptions, but then there is a lot of uh, rich information which comes out of it. So, you can use that as a basis for doing more uh, complicated analysis by relaxing some of the assumptions. Okay? That is the idea. So, what is this capillary jet instability problem? It is one, supposing you have a jet of liquid falling vertically down and that is the let us say that is the uh, vertical direction. What we expect is because of the gravitational force, the jet is going to accelerate okay? and because it accelerates, it is going to constrict. Eventually, what you see is this guy is going to pinch off and you are going to get <laughs> drops. Okay? That is an experiment which you see every day in the morning when you open the tap in your uh, bathroom. Okay? So, the idea is, is it possible for us to make a prediction of the size of these drops? How does this happen? What is it that is causing this thing to break? Because theoretically, it can keep on shrinking and then uh, keep on thinning down and it can go on forever. The velocity will keep on increasing. So, what is it that is causing it to break into drops? It is clearly the surface tension effect. Okay? And that is the reason this is called the capillary jet instability because capillary is basically associated with surface tension. Okay? So, again here surface tension is important and has to be included. In the model, right? Otherwise, you won't be able to actually get this breakup. Okay. The uh, other thing we're going to do is we're going to do something similar to what we did for the Rayleigh-Taylor uh, problem. We're going to assume that the jet is inviscid because viscosity is not really the one which is causing the jet breakup. Viscosity is only going to possibly change the 
rate of growth is not going to decide whether it's positive or negative. It's going to make the growth rate small if viscosity is high. So if you have a very less, uh, very viscous fluid, like honey, and you just drag uh, and drop honey from a height, the honey is not going to break. Okay, because it's going to break after a very very long time. So the time for breakup, the growth of the disturbance is going to be very large. Okay, or the growth rate is very low. Okay, so. Viscosity is not really going to decide this. It's only going to make it uh, break further away. Okay. What we are interested in is when it breaks, what is the size of the drop? Supposing that's the question you are asking, then you can actually neglect the effect of viscosity. Okay. Anyway, we'll neglect it, and if you think it is important, we can always include it later. So we will follow Lord Rayleigh, and uh, we'll make another simplification which is we will consider the jet to be stationary or a horizontal circular I'll just call it a thread. So this is very a hypothetical situation again, which means you just imagine something like a circular uh, jet with no velocity. It's just a blob of liquid, which is in the form of a circular cylinder, and it's stationary. Okay. That's your uh, geometry. So the question now is, is this, if you had such a liquid thread, would it break up into drops because of surface tension? Okay. And uh, there is no acceleration like we had here. So that would clearly depend upon the size because the surface tension force is going to depend upon the size of this thread. So the smaller the thread, the more is going to be the effect of the surface tension force because the surface area to volume ratio is higher. Okay. So the question we are asking is, um, will this thread break up and disintegrate into drops okay and uh, the next question would be what would be the size of the drops that we get so what are the advantages of making this, these assumptions that i have so what have i done i've made a lot of assumptions one inviscid no viscosity i'm also saying that this jet is not moving it's just sitting there okay which means I go back to this problem which was similar to my Rayleigh Binet problem where my base state was having zero velocity. My Rayleigh Taylor problem where the base state was zero velocity. Here again, my base state is zero velocity. That just helps me uh, do the analysis okay, and get some insight. So if you're not happy with any of these assumptions, then you have to go and uh, that becomes a homework problem. right? So what, that's what we'll do. We assume that this is the base state. Well, we don't assume the base state. The base state is the trivial solution u equal to zero. All three components are zero. Okay. Liquid is not moving, and clearly corresponding to this base state, there is going to be a pressure distribution. Okay. And uh, what is going to be the pressure distribution when you have a flat uh, interface, or not a flat interface, a circular? Uh, interface, there is going to be a difference in the pressures. The pressure here is not going to be the same as the pressure in the atmosphere. Okay? Let us say the ambient fluid is atmospheric and you have P atmosphere here and this is uh, P because there is only one pressure which is that of the liquid. That is the uh, pressure of the liquid. So clearly P minus P atmosphere equals gamma divided by R. Okay. This 1 by r turns out to be del dot n. We will see that when we do this analysis. 
So, this is actually gamma del dot n, del dot n turns out to be 1 by r, okay. So, that is my base state. There is a pressure uh, difference, there is a pressure jump across this interface, okay, and that is because the liquid is actually curved. So, if you look at the cross section, the cross section is actually circular, okay. And in order for it to maintain this circular shape, you need to have P greater than P atmosphere. This is different. So, in order to analyze this problem, we use the same approach as what we did earlier. Write down the governing equations. We have the base state and we need to do the linearization and uh, go ahead with the solution. Again, same business of trying to decompose into uh, wave numbers. Uh, what we will do is, we are going to assume that this thread is infinitely long, okay. If the thread is infinitely long and uh, so then I can actually decompose it in terms of some kind of a Fourier mode, okay. The uh, other thing that we can do is uh, make a further assumption of that being axis symmetry in the problem, okay. That is, there is no variation in the theta direction, okay. That is just to make the algebra easy. In fact, uh, people have worked with by including the theta direction also and there is a result which, uh, you, you know, you can get again analytically. So, we further assume what do we assume? Theta symmetry, okay, and infinite extent in the z direction. So it's going is a very infinitely long thread because. If I do not assume infinite in the z direction, I need to put boundary conditions and I will be at a loss of how to uh, answer that question, okay. So, this basically gives you some insight. So, we write the equation of continuity which is 1 by r under these assumptions, this becomes this plus d by dz of uz equals 0, that is my equation of continuity. And then I have rho d by dt of ur plus ur dur by dr plus uz dur by dz equals minus dp by dr, okay. And then similarly, I have. The viscous term does not show up because I'm assuming it's inviscid, okay. And uh, let us say I'm just doing this thing uh, without any gravitational effect because I don't think gravity is the one which I'm interested in studying. If I want to study the effect of gravity, I do the vertical jet problem because that's the one which is actually going to cause the breakup. What I'm focusing on is I'm focusing on how the surface tension is going to actually cause the breakup, okay. So gravity is neglected, and then I have. Okay, remember what we have done is neglect thing, gravity and viscosity. I need to keep surface tension, but that is going to come in the boundary condition. So, you can already see a little bit of what is going to happen. So, those are my governing equations subject to the boundary conditions which are my kinematic boundary condition and my normal stress boundary condition, okay. Those are the two conditions which I need to invoke just like we did for the Rayleigh-Taylor problem at the interface here, okay. So, we will do that, but first let me just uh, deal with the equations here. Assume 
u r is of the form u r s s plus epsilon u r tilde. Okay, that's my steady state. That's my perturbation, which is order epsilon. What I want to do is, u r s s of course is zero because nothing is moving; the jet is stationary. Okay, and similarly, you can put for the u z also. So, if you put that, the equation of continuity for the perturbations, this becomes. Tilda plus this is of at order epsilon, okay. Do the same thing for the Navier Stokes equation. What do you get? D by dt of u r tilde plus epsilon times that plus epsilon times u r tilde times d by d r of epsilon u r tilde plus epsilon u z tilde d by d z of tilde times epsilon again equals Minus dp by dr of steady state plus epsilon p tilde. Okay. These terms again, the convective terms are of order epsilon squared, and therefore these guys drop off at order epsilon. The other thing which I want to mention here is dpss by dr is zero. What we're talking about is the pressure inside the liquid in the radial direction is going to be zero because if it's not zero, there's going to be some kind of a convection. Okay, I've assumed there's no convection, no velocity in the radial direction. Therefore, dpss by dr has to be zero. Um, what that means is the pressure is uniform in the cross section, but there is a pressure jump across the interface because P1 minus P2, P atmosphere is gamma divided by R. So, in the cross section, the pressure is uniform. Okay? So, what this means is PSS is independent of R, and so at order epsilon, my linearized equation is this. You can do the same thing for the other direction. Similarly, you get rho dou u z tilde by dou t equals minus d p tilde by d z. Okay. Again, the steady state, the gradient is zero for the pressure in the axial direction. So, as far as the equations are concerned, these are the equations. Okay, but then I need to solve this subject to some boundary conditions. And what we do is we don't worry about boundary conditions in the axial direction. Why? Because it's infinitely long, and so we're going to give periodic perturbations in that direction. What we need to do is worry about the boundary conditions in the radial direction, and that involves the normal stress boundary condition and the kinematic boundary condition. What I want to do is, I want to talk about, uh, so when I am doing this uh, linearized analysis, I am going to give a perturbation and what this perturbation is going to do is, is going to be of the, some arbitrary perturbation. I am drawing it periodically here, but I mean it is some arbitrary perturbation here. Okay, um, as a result of which the surface can deflect. So when I'm going to giving a disturbance, the I'm not restricting my surface to be circular and conserve volume. Okay, so the, as a result of the disturbance, the 
the surface deforms. The interface is going to deform. Okay, that's the general situation, and that's what we're interested in. I have to include this in my model, otherwise the case is not going to break, right? I mean, if I keep my interface uh, flat, it's going to remain in a circle for the uh, ever. So I need to include this thing and see how this guy uh, is going to behave. And uh, if your uh, radius of the unperturbed surface is a, then r equals a is the base state okay and what we can do is the perturbed state is r equals a multiplied by 1 plus epsilon times f of z so i'm giving a perturbation the perturbation is the form of fz some arbitrary function of z okay and it's a very small perturbation and that i'm indicating by epsilon here same thing as what we did for the uh, rayleigh taylor problem okay only thing is the rayleigh taylor problem i had h which was function of x and y okay but now to make my life simple, I am just saying that things are not changing in the theta direction. That is the reason I have not included my theta dependency here. Okay, Because it is axisymmetric, theta does not show up. Only It varies only in the z direction. Just keeps the algebra a bit simple. But at the end of the day, you saw when we included two directions, x and y, the two wave numbers which I can actually combine most of the time. Right? I got alpha x squared plus alpha y squared and I just said that was equal to uh, some alpha squared. So, mathematically only it becomes slightly different, otherwise the analysis is the same. Okay. What we want to do is we want to get the normal stress boundary condition. The normal stress boundary condition is what I wrote earlier, which is P1 minus P2 equals gamma multiplied by del dot n. That is my normal stress boundary condition. And this is going to be valid always in the sense P is actual pressure. In fact, I should not write P2, this is actually P ambient, right? That is constant. And uh, what I want to do now is calculate this del dot n, which is my curvature, and but I need to find del dot n for this deformed surface, because well, that is the general case. So, how do you find n? Before finding del dot n, I need to find n. And remember is gradient of f divided by absolute value of the gradient of f and that is n okay and f is r minus a times 1 plus epsilon f of z okay this is f equal to 0 so what is the gradient of f E r minus A epsilon f prime, f prime is d f by d z divided by 1 plus, no that is, no, this is the gradient of f. I am just differentiating this with respect to r, that is associated with uh, 1 E r, differentiated with respect to z, I get A epsilon f prime and that is associated with E z, okay, and therefore n is going to be. So that is my uh, unit normal vector, okay. And what I need to do is calculate del dot n. I am not sure if we did this problem already. Uh, maybe we did. Uh, remember, somebody was talking about two curvatures, and uh, that is what I want to show today. Um, okay, we need to calculate del dot n. And how do you calculate del dot n? It is E r by r d by d r of r 
plus EZ D by DZ okay operating on N which is Okay. So, what I need to do is operate, I am doing the dot product, E R and E Z are perpendicular to each other, is that a problem? I think so fine. I am taking the dot product, so E R dotted with E R is 1, E R dotted with E Z is 0 and I need to consider this term with that term and this with this, okay, E R and E Z are perpendicular. What I also want you to recognize is that this particular term is a function only of z, it does not contain r, the entire thing is independent of r, okay. So, for all practical purposes, when I am differentiating with respect to r, this guy is going to give me 0, but then I will have, I have to use the product rule, r multiplied by that, right, I have to use the product rule. So, what I will get is 1 by r times this with that 1 plus a square epsilon square f prime squared. That is what this is going to give me 1 by r times this and e r dotted with e r is 1 and that is d by dr of r which is 1, okay. This is just uh, mathematics, so you do not have to worry too much about it. But and now we are going to do this with that, but now you remember that this is a function of z. So, you have to use some quotient rule like we did uh, the last time and uh, maybe what I will do is just write this plus d by dz of minus a epsilon f prime divided by square root of 1 plus a square epsilon square f prime square. Okay, so use the quotient rule now, and uh, it's going to be similar to what we did. I, I would like to actually uh, write the answer, but I'm not sure of the sign, minus or plus. So I just have to do it again. Okay, I'm looking at the second term over there. It's d by dz. Um, we can just write the second term. Denominator. times derivative of the numerator which is I think it is minus plus a epsilon f prime numerator times the derivative of the denominator right which is uh, 1 by 2. times f double prime. So, you bring that to this side and uh, you can do the simplification, okay. Since I have done this problem before, I think this is what you will get. That's what you get. It's a minus sign. This is exactly what we got last time. You take the denominator here, multiply it, and this will cancel off with this, and you have this multiplied by one contributing. So that's the second term, and therefore del dot n is equal to one by r times one plus a square epsilon square f prime square to the power half minus a epsilon f double prime divided by that is what we get.
Now, I want you to focus on the fact that the curvature term is actually made up of two terms, okay. And um, I want to give you some physical significance to these two terms. The significance is that this particular term is what I would call a radial curvature. And this is an axial curvature. Okay. And uh, just to explain uh, what these things mean, look at this deformed thread. So, you have a curvature along the plane of the board. Okay. The curvature along the plane of the board. That is the RZ plane. This is Z and this is R. RZ plane is my axial curvature. And this is my F of Z, remember. This is F of Z. So, this is associated with my F double prime. Okay. In the R theta plane, the R theta plane is actually perpendicular to this. Okay. It is circular. Why do I say it is circular? Because I have assumed theta symmetry. If you want, you can uh, assume non circular, but basically in the R theta plane, this is the shape. So, there is a curvature of the cross section. Okay. And this curvature is the radial curvature. So, there are essentially two effects. One is the radial curvature, one is the axial curvature and both of them together give you the actual curvature which you have to include in the problem. Okay. So, well we have got this uh, particular thing del dot n. What we have to do is we have to use this in our boundary condition, the normal stress boundary condition. And the normal stress boundary condition, we have to again do a perturbation series analysis, get the term of order epsilon to the power 0, get the term of order epsilon to the power 1. Okay. And because the uh, equations of or to, or to the order of epsilon, the boundary conditions also have to be of the order of epsilon. The way I am going to convert this to order epsilon is just by do a, doing a binomial series expansion. I take this to the numerator, take it to the power minus half and do a power series expansion, do the same thing there and find out what is the term of order epsilon, what is the term of order epsilon to the power 0. Okay. So, once we do that, at least the normal stress boundary condition is clear. Okay. The normal stress boundary condition, remember, is P1 minus P2 equals gamma del dot n and I am going to write this as P1 SS minus, oh sorry, plus epsilon P1 tilde minus P atmosphere, P1, S, P1 is P1 SS plus epsilon P1 tilde, P2 is P atmosphere, outside liquid. Okay, equals gamma my surface tension times this guy. Power half. Okay, so do your binomial uh, series expansion. 1 minus half of a squared epsilon squared f prime squared etcetera etcetera. Right? Is that right? Yeah? Um, but the r can change with z, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, at order, that's what we're going to get. Let us do this, then you will know. In that first term, here? 
Um, it means that's what we're going to find out. At order epsilon, we'll find out what it is. What it is at order epsilon to the power zero, and what it is at order epsilon to the power one. Okay, so we'll find that out when we do this. So you're, you're, you're talking about this term, right? You're talking about this term. You are telling me whether it's going to be always of order, uh, whether it's going to be always equal to one by r. Yeah, but the r can change with z. Yeah. So I am getting 1 upon r into some extra term. So does it mean that uh, that extra term is equal to 1? No, I don't know. It doesn't mean the extra term is equal to 1. The radial curvature you are saying is equal to 1 by r. And uh, no, the this is the radial curvature. Okay. And um, let us do like this. Let me finish my, I will answer your question. But let me finish this analysis and then we will come to your question. Um, so how does this binomial series thing work? 1 by 1 plus nx minus a epsilon times f double prime times 1 minus 3 by 2 times a square epsilon squared f prime squared plus etc. Okay. Is this right? Yeah. So now uh, I forgot something here. This R itself is varying with Z. I need to include the fact that R is actually 1 plus A epsilon F of Z. Because I am going to be evaluating this along the boundary. At the boundary, R is not equal to A. For the perturbed surface, R is actually 1 plus A epsilon F of Z. Okay. So this has to be, I need to do a binomial series expansion of this as well. Take it to the top. So this is going to now give me a into, ah, you are right. Yeah, yeah, a into 1 plus epsilon, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So this is going to be gamma times by a times 1 minus epsilon f to the power minus 1 times 1 minus half times a square epsilon squared f prime squared. I do not worry about this term because this is a higher order term. Okay. When I multiply this and this is going to give me minus a epsilon f double prime. The rest of the terms are higher order terms. Here I get gamma by a 1 plus epsilon f times 1 minus this thing. I am not sure if there is a sign uh, problem. Is, where is it 1 plus? Yeah. Yeah, that is good. It should be plus because this should be minus. Yeah, now, I'm, now everything is fine. I was wondering if I made a mistake again. So this gives me gamma by A minus gamma by A F epsilon minus A epsilon F double prime. So I do not know uh, if this answers your question that the radial curvature is actually gamma by A, I mean at order epsilon, it can be written as gamma by A minus gamma by A f epsilon. So this is your radial curvature when you do the binomial series expansion. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to look at the left hand side and the right hand side. This, these terms are of order epsilon to the power 0. This is going to balance this term which is of order epsilon to the power 0. This p1 tilde is going to balance the order epsilon terms. So what this means is the boundary conditions the normal stress boundary condition gives me P1SS minus P atmosphere equals 
gamma divided by A and P1 tilde is equal to minus gamma by A f minus I think the gamma multiplying this also right. The gamma multiplying this gamma A F double prime. Yeah, that is basically what your uh, normal stress boundary condition is at order epsilon. So, this is how your perturbation pressure is going to vary. Okay. So, all I have done is written the normal stress boundary condition to order epsilon. I mean, whenever you have any term like uh, something having an epsilon, a function of epsilon in the denominator or a sine or a cosine term, you are going to do a Taylor series expansion and then uh, reduce it to order epsilon, a, a power series in epsilon, that is what we have done. Okay. And uh, this is remember fine because in the base state that is what I expect and for the perturbed state this is what I expect. Okay.